Welcome, thank you for joining us today. So uh, I'm just gonna briefly introduce our panelists. We have um, Roman Coppola, Hi, filmmaker, award-winning screenwriter, entrepreneur, and um, one of the co-founders of Decentralized Pictures. Um, then we have filmmaker Tiffany Lin, um, a graduate of USC, who has won the first award that was given out by Decentralized Picture for her short film called Poachers. And um, then we have Leo Matchett, who is the CEO and co-founder of Decentralized Pictures, and he will tell us what Decentralized Pictures is. Thank you, Barbara, for that great introduction. Uh, so Decentralized Pictures is a nonprofit to uh, promote and stimulate the cinematic arts and the arts in general um, that we founded, uh, and we're using blockchain, block, <coughs> excuse me, blockchain technology to uh, help in that curation process um, for efficiency reasons and um, for, for transparency and fairness uh, in who gets supported by the nonprofit. But uh, we have a little explainer video. Um, it, if we can cue that, maybe we can watch that. It's a couple minutes long and it gives a brief overview of the, of the project. It's no mystery that Hollywood can benefit from diversity and fresh voices. There is an ongoing inequity with regards to on and off screen representation and talent. Though this is improving, the industry still has a long way to go. Decentralized Pictures was created to provide new opportunities and open doors for all independent filmmakers. DCP uses blockchain technology to find new talent from all communities, giving them a platform to share their innovative stories. Using a fair, democratic and transparent protocol, DCP's community of submitters, reviewers and moderators aim to open the doors of Hollywood to support artists who don't have connections or monetary backing. Film lovers and creators alike benefit from participating. Community members earn rewards for sharing their opinions and curating the projects and artists they enjoy and support. Creators not only win funding for their projects, but also get connected with industry mentors and partners for development, production, sales, and distribution. A portion of financing awards and opportunities will be eligible exclusively to voices that to date have not had sufficient amplification and representation. By increasing access for independent filmmakers, DCP hopes to bring important issues to light and provide more diverse and creative content to the screen. We hope you'll join the mission of supporting independent and underrepresented creators in sharing their stories. Um, so how is it exactly that blockchain helps support filmmakers through de decentralized pictures and how does the platform work, more or less? Yeah, so uh, part of what we're trying to solve or the problem is what we've been calling the drinking from a fire hose problem. So many um, places uh, do not accept unsolicited ma uh, material. So, you know, for someone who's an unknown artist, it can be difficult uh, to, to even if you are very, very talented and you've written this brilliant screenplay, how do you get it to the right people if you don't know someone or you don't have significant financial backing? Um, so we're opening up uh, this submission portal um, and, and you know, we, instead of having a development department that's gonna read through all the screenplays and pick the ones that they think are the best, we're gonna outsource that review to the world and we're gonna use uh, an incentive model using blockchain uh, and the efficiencies that it brings to uh, make that a possibility. So how that works is when someone wants to submit their idea, they pay a submission fee. That fee doesn't go to the foundation, it actually goes into a smart contract, which then in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion uh, pays out anyone in the community who will give an opinion on that project. So, and through that process we get you know really great data to see which demographics a certain project is striking a chord with uh, and, and the decisions to, to which filmmakers we support and finance are ultimately up to the community in that regard because they're voting on, on the ones that they like. Um, so yeah, uh, you, you, for, for people that don't want to or can't afford to buy a submission fee, um, they can just sign up for free at the platform start reviewing other people's material until they build up enough of a balance so that they can submit their own. So um, we wanted it to be accessible for, for all artists. 
Um, thank you. Um, Roman, mm -hmm. I would love to hear how you got involved and how you think this platform can um, help filmmakers in ways that maybe now they're not supported. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got involved because Leo and I are, are colleagues and we've worked together over the years. Uh, uh, Leo is also a producer and um, he became acquainted with uh, blockchain and introduced me to it uh, years ago. And, you know, I have to say I've been, I have a little radar out for new technologies. It's something that I grew up around you know, in, in my family, uh, of course, a film family, but technology and gadgets and innovation is, is, uh, has always been of interest. And, you know, cinema is a, is, is requires technology to, uh, that's, you know, is founded on photochemical process, mechanical process, and over the years now has become digitized. So there's something about um, uh, my history and heritage that kind of has this weird attraction of art and technology. Uh, just to tell a little anecdote, my great-grandfather built the device, the, the Vitaphone, which was the first uh, uh, means to have synchronous sound with movies. He was an uh, engineer uh, machinist, so he built that. And just over the years, my dad's work and uh, uh, all these different generations, uh, there's been this emphasis and interest in technology. My dad had the first flatbed editorial machines. We did the first uh, multi-track uh, surround re recordings for cinema. So I think there's a genetic thing or something I'm surrounded with that is fascinated by technology and immediately like, oh, how could this uh, be a tool uh, for, for filmmaking? Um, you know, that coupled with the fact that it's really hard to get your film off the ground, you know, and people think I have a, some super special access and they certainly Ha, do have uh, connections and relationships, but it's hard to uh, to finance your film, to get it to the right people, and you need that kind of momentum. And so it just felt like, wow, if we could solve a really big problem, which is how can I get my foot in the door, uh, that would be really significant. And uh, uh, so many people I meet, uh, you know, in an event like this afterwards, like, oh, I got a great script, or how who can I send it to, or do you know an agent that might want to represent me? And there's just this hunger to be, to participate, and uh, it's so exclusive, and it's really uh, uh, inequitable, and so the, the, the democratic aspect of, of blockchain and what we're trying to do uh, is exciting, because uh, to, to hope and to think that some new voices, some uh, uh, fresh ideas and talent will, will come to our attention. Like with Tiffany, that's my plug and you can bring her <laughs> into the story, but we're getting to know each other and it's all due to her participation uh, submitting her short that required some finishing funds and we found, we made that connection through DCP. So Tiffany, would you like to talk a little bit about how you found out about DCP and how um, things worked out with your short film? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned before, um, I graduated from USC, um, and so DCP and USC were kind of doing this beta test, and I learned about it through their industry relations office. Um, so kind of on a whim, I like signed up. I had this project poachers that happened to be like in post-production where we were looking for funds. Um, so I actually got to go on the platform and submit a pitch um, sort of like like how you would do, um, yeah, like just in like this normal situation. Um, and I guess enough people liked it, um, and they liked it too. And yeah, now here we are. Um, we just finished uh, our sound mix uh, at the end of February, and now we're just kind of submitting it to festivals and everything. So uh, how did it work with um, the feedback that you, that you received? And um, yeah, how did that help you? with your film as well. Yeah, I think uh, for our specific situation, it was really interesting to kind of see um, what people resonated with in the story. Um, so Poachers, my film, is about these two girls who come across this uh, unique business opportunity of illegally harvesting and selling succulents. And so it's like a very, like, yeah, it's a very niche topic. Uh, but I think within this film, there were like a lot of different facets of it that people kind of identified and really resonated with whether it was kind of like this idea of like female friendships or coming of age um, or people who just really like plants. Um, it was just kind of like really interesting to hear what people were like grabbing onto and why they liked it. Uh, maybe we could watch the trailer for Poachers. Yeah, let's watch it. <laughs> um, cue the trailer. 
It's so easy to think nothing of these plants. In Chinese, these are called xirinzo. I'm curious, Tiffany, um, do you think that, did you feel that you got kind of a preview of the audience experience while you were submitting your project and getting this feedback and sort of you could test the temperature of the things that worked and that maybe in the editing you could, you could change? Because I think that that would be on DCP an important part of the platform. Yeah, I think um, specifically for this project, um, I think it was a really, a valuable way to look at like how we could possibly like market or like distribute the film. Um, I think with the premise, like it does seem like very ridiculous. I think when you first like hear about it, um, but I think the tone of the film is also like very. It's very different. Kind of. It's not. Um, it's not. It's not this like. Fun, it's not just like a fun road trip. You know. Um, so I think uh, being able to see like what people's like conceptions of the film were versus sort of like what. Like maybe if people were taking these a little more seriously, um, just it was really interesting just to see like different ways to approach like how we could present this project to the world. And you mentioned to me um, previously that you think that there's some platform funding fatigue um, amongst your peers and your students because everyone needs to finance their film. As Roman said, it's very difficult. When you're starting out, you have to reach out to friends and family. And um, yeah, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on, on that and how this platform could be different and is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when I first started out in filmmaking, that was sort of like the rise of like Kickstarter and like Indiegogo and like all of these crowdfunding platforms. Um, and I think a lot of young filmmakers especially have really gravitated towards that because I, um, I think the appeal of it is that you can kind of build an audience as well as just getting um, these like larger amounts of money that like you might not normally have access to but I think as the years have gone by there has been sort of like an oversaturation of this where like every time like I open social media there's like a new campaign to donate to and I think people are sort of again yeah, getting fatigue from it where it's like before you could get a lot of momentum with your projects um, and now it's like becoming a little bit more difficult and so I think with DCP um, it's it's like a really interesting opportunity to sort of directly connect um, different financiers or like different people who want to see um, a certain type of media in the world um, and connecting them with these like really hungry like emerging filmmakers who really want to make a project. Um, and I think like as the pandemic you know has gone on, like people have more and more uh, started to go outside of like the normal like system and just trying to like get their projects off the ground. Um, and I think DCP does like fulfill a really interesting niche within that ecosystem. Thank you. And um, Neil, maybe you could tell us more about the awards that are available and your partnerships. Yeah, uh, just to continue what Tiffany was saying, uh, you know, think of DCP as Kickstarter, but in reverse, where, you know, instead of asking the world to give you money for your project, you're essentially paying the world to tell you if they like your project or not. Um, so we've kind of flipped it on its head and, you know, we're excited to find out what it, what comes of it. Um, but, uh, so, sorry. Yeah, no, I was... <laughs> <laughs> Remind me. What, I was just saying what kind of um, awards, like, will it be funding, oh. will it be mentorship? Um, yeah. I know I'm, that I'm, I'm, there's, I various, there's various levels of um, participation that DCP can provide based on who the, the projects that are voted the most... Um, the most voted projects, I guess. Right, right. Okay, so uh, the first um, award we're going to be doing, and, and so these awards will be staggered throughout, you know, a given year. Um, and so, you know, when some submissions are coming in for one, let's say for uh, $100,000 to finishing funds for a documentary, um, you know, we will be queuing up the next one. And um, we plan to do them on a rolling basis this way. Um, 
I'm not certain that we can say, you know, all of the partnerships that we have, but we have some very exciting um, mentors and, and, and folks that have been, have donated to, to the platform. Um, uh, the first one is in partnership with the Gotham Film Festival, and uh, that's gonna be an unscripted documentary uh, award, and, you know, we are gonna be offering finishing funds for that. Um, the, uh, the second one is uh, in partnership with Steven Soderbergh. He made a uh, very generous donation to the foundation and he uh, will be using those for finishing funds for um, scripted uh, films. And um, uh, so yeah, things like that. And, and um, you know, we're encouraging donors and, and mentors to help guide and shepherd the filmmakers through the process. We as a foundation will also do that. We are executive producing these films in, in the traditional sense. We are financing them. These are not uh, grants that we're giving out for the most part. There, there will be some that are you know, smaller um, grants, but for, for the larger awards, they will be financing. So we as a foundation will stand to recoup uh, our investment and, and share in the waterfall of profit participation. However, as a 501c3 nonprofit, all of the revenue will go back into the fund to help finance future artists. So the intention is to create a, uh, you know, evergreen film fund uh, that, um, you know, we can continually uh, support artists throughout the years. I have a follow-up question, which is um, the title of the panel is Blockchain Philanthropy. And so um, where does the philanthropy aspect come in? And I know that, for example, donors can set up funds for specific causes and, um, and that there's a, um, a strong intention to reach out to, or, or try to um, support um, outside filmmakers, um, underrepresented voices. So I'm just wondering what the plans are for that, um, yeah, the philanthropic aspect. Yeah, so um, we're encouraging uh, people that you know, have a specific cause or um, you know, issue that they want to shed light on that's important to them. Um, they can make a donation to the foundation, and we've you know, made it clear to the people that we talk to that 100% of their donation will go to the winning filmmaker. So then we will put out a call uh, for submissions for filmmakers that are interested in that particular subject matter and they can um, submit their pitch of how they would approach telling that story, who they are as a filmmaker, why it's important to them uh, to tell that story, and, and the community will vote on, on whose pitch to get that donation and, and go out and, you know, call, let's say it's a documentary about, um, you know, sea turtles that someone really wants, you know, a film about. And um, anyone who's interested in, in making that film can, can submit and, and get money to do it. And, and we will help them. Uh, with resources, uh, depending on what they need, production or legal or what have you, to, to support them and give them an uh, opportunity as an artist. So, yeah. And um, thank you. Roman, um, I know that there's an illustrious board behind this mm -hmm. and they will also be helping and supporting filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about that, but also, um, I know that apprenticeship is important to you in mm -hmm. filmmaking, so I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, I grew up in the world of filmmaking, and I was always, you know, as a kid, I would uh, get help as a PA, a gopher, and my first professional job was I was a, a makeup assistant, and my, my, I had to braid the mane of a horse and put a wig in the, in the incorporate <laughs> into the mane of the horse. I was on the Black Stallion Returns. And you know that's sort of a, just a tradition in in art and, and of course in movies. And then you work your way up, and then you have uh, uh, the ability to share your knowledge and help the next generation. So that's something that's familiar to me and has a great tradition. You know, in in the past, uh, great painters would have a uh, you know apprentice uh, uh, people in their lives, and they would clean the brushes and maybe fill in a little detail in a painting, and then. You know, that invited a conversation. They'd ask the master, oh, why do you do this? Or, uh, you know, guide me. And then similarly, the, the master would have some insight from a younger person uh, being sharing some enthusiasm. In fact, uh, my dad is working on a new project, and he wanted to do some rehearsals. So we got all these high school students to come and work out some rehearsals with him. And it was very just a love fest of, he was so stimulated by being around high school kids and all the, the enthusiasm they shared. 
and they were excited to be around what he was thinking about in this, uh, you know, a legend of, 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 film, of film. So, anyway, that that sentiment is means a lot to me, and I felt that um, uh, you know to participate in this way and to give the guidance we can. We plan to have a lot of you know AMAs and a sort of a vibrant community of established filmmakers that can participate, whether it's Steven Soderbergh offering this award or uh, other filmmakers you know, giving guidance or being part of it. And um, so that's something, uh, you know, the, it's not exclusively uh, uh, for young people, but it's for new voices, you know, and, um, and to have some of the momentum that we can bring or I can bring in, in our group of more established people, it's sort of a privilege and a thrill to like sponsor some new possibility. Thank you. Um, Leo. <laughs> I, um, I'm curious about the, the system of voting for projects and um, Roman mentioned, and you both mentioned Steven Soderbergh and um, hopefully he'll be a user. Maybe he's, he already is a user, likely. But um, is his input how, how does his input in the feedback process become more valuable? Is it the same as everyone else's? And how, how does that work? How, how does one, I guess you build credibility and reputation, something like that. That's exactly right. So as you interact with the platform over time and your interactions are either important or not important to other people in the community, you will gain user reputation. You can also gain your user reputation by um, being accurate over time, you know, uh, being uh, promoting films that end up winning. Um, there's also a time factor. So if you're a trend setter versus a trend follower, uh, you will earn reputation. Um, and, and the reputation system is really to avoid uh, civil type of attacks on the network. <laughs> and just for people who don't know what that is, it's, uh, you know, you have a thousand Twitter followers and you tell them all to go vote for your film and, and give it all 100%. Um, it's to mitigate that type, type of attack you in the voting system. It. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that someone who's signing up for the first time, uh, their vote doesn't count. Of course it does. Um, so there are very, like many variables in, in the calculations of how those, the you know, films are rated. Um, but uh, you know, we felt that that was important because Certain people are just very good at analyzing creative material. And, um, you know, we didn't want to replicate the current system, of course, right? We don't want that to replicate itself. So we feel like we need to set a baseline and have everyone either earn or lose reputation from that starting point. Um, and, you know, hopefully the people that uh, end up selecting the, the content that gets, that gets supported um, yeah, they will earn reputation. So, um, yeah. But I think part of the question had to do if if, some, if I'm participating and I have more of a reputation already through my professional life, that if Steven Soderbergh is engaging, that he might come in at a higher bar uh, than uh, average Joe. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, this, this is a has been a contended issue. <laughs> I'll say that. Mm -hmm. um, right. Juicy. <laughs> certain people argue that. Everyone should start at the same level. Mm -hmm. um, and certain people, I think, argue that, you know, people who have a track record of success in the industry um, should be able to, you know, check a box, I'm a professional, and they will inherit a certain amount of reputation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe what we do is we do a poll on whether we should do one or the other, because, uh, well, yeah. That's Tiffany. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've, I've, um, I've heard good arguments for both sides of it, and, and it's a tough one. Um, so when we launch later this month, hopefully, the platform publicly, we will have an answer to that question. Um, but yeah, I, I did hear that as part of the question. I, yeah. I, I kind of tried to sidestep it, but, I, but thanks, Roman, I for bringing I shoved you out under the bus. <laughs> Um, so would Tiffany actually see who's like giving, would it be like Steven Soderbergh says, like that's his username, yeah. Yeah, so you can set your own username. Um, you can also click an anonymous box okay. if you don't want anyone to know it's, it's you. Um, but I feel like part of it is, you know, if, if you are a, a established well-known filmmaker and you endorse a project, I think that will go a long way. So 
you know, it is up to, to whoever the reviewer is, whether they want their review to be, or their, their name to be public. If they want to write a written review, that will be public, um, but no one needs to know who it is. And would people be submitting sort of traditional pitching materials? Um, is that something that you've already established? Great question. So, you know, based on the, the award that they're, they're pitching at, I will be different types of materials. Okay. So, but uh, we encourage for, I mean, part of the onboarding process is we recommend doing a pitch video of some kind. I mean, you don't need to show your face or anything, but, you know, I think it's compelling to, to the, the community, or it will be compelling to the community. Tell, tell the community who you are as a filmmaker, who your influences are, why this story is important to you. Um, you know, why did you get into filmmaking? Um, you know, what you would say to an executive at a studio if you walked into his office and they said, or his office, their, their office, and said, you know, yeah, you have five minutes, go. Tell me about your, your project. Um, so I, I feel like it is, it, it is that, but to a, to a, a large group. Thank you. And um, so I know that you're operating in the English language at the moment, English projects or English subtitled projects. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious about whether you're thinking of expanding and how, how that's going to play out. Right. Um, so as the uh, platform grows, um, we, we want it to be a multi-language uh, platform and, and be a global platform. Uh, however, most of the community that is in our circle now uh, are English language speaking. Um, so we are starting with English language, uh, but that doesn't mean it can be the audio in another language as long as there's uh, English language sub subtitles. Um, but uh, one of the, the steps in onboarding to becoming a user is, do you speak any other languages besides English? Or what languages do you speak? And you can check those off. And um, you know that's been another thing we've been sort of going back and forth on is um, how many people in, this, in the system do we need speaking a certain language to, to so until we feel, OK, we, we're going to get enough reviewers to get enough data in, in, in that language. And, and there will be enough people that can actually review it, because um, that's the whole the whole purpose here is, you know, um, let's get data on what projects people are liking and, and give support to those artists. So um, I feel like it's it's somewhere in the five to ten thousand plus range of, of users that would speak a certain language before we could feel confident about, um, you know, doing awards in, in strictly those languages. But again, uh, and uh, English subtitles for a foreign film. I think would be fine, you know, or translated version of a screenplay. But screenplays don't always translate well. So um, yeah, it's a tough one. OK. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, um, I had a question about some filmmakers may have concerns about the environmental um, downsides of, of using crypto and um, using blockchain. And, you know, I mean, I think we're all very much conscious about that. So I'm wondering what DCP is doing to counterbalance that. So um, we are uh, currently in the process of becoming a carbon neutral company. Our blockchain uh, is, uses proof of stake um, consensus. So for everyone who may not know what that means, um, it's unlike proof of work, which takes vast amounts of computational um, capacity to, to create new blocks in the chain, um, where people are racing to, to solve um, <laughs> uh, solve the block or you know be the first person to, to create the new block in, in a proof of work network, um, and and so it's about 99% more efficient in terms of um, one network versus another. Uh, and our, ours is, you know, the proof of stake. Uh, of course, there are arguments of why proof of stake versus proof of work are have their own security flaws. I won't get into that right now, unless you want me to. But um, yeah, so uh, we are actively. Uh, well, currently, we're we're going to become carbon neutral as an organization, and then we hope to extend that into all of the productions that we're going to finance to the extent we can. I mean, certain filmmakers may not want, I mean, we don't want to 
you know, say, oh, you have to have a, uh, a carbon neutral production, but we will definitely encourage it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. And I just wanted to rem remind everyone um, to ask questions and we'll answer them in a short while. And um, so I, have, I wanted to ask Roman and Leo how you both feel about the rise in popularity of NFTs and um, there's a lot of you know, talk about different blockchain projects and how they, they intersect with um, art and film. And uh, I know that you guys have been at this for several years, since 2017. So I'm just wondering how you feel about all of that. I'll go first because you have a lot more to say, and then I'll pass it to you. <laughs> um, I'm quite proud that we have been working on this for around five years, and we've been very methodical uh, under Leo's guidance and Mike's guidance to do this step-by-step uh, step the right way. And there have been occasions where it's like, oh, wow, the NFTs are so popular. Let's make this an NFT platform. There's a lot of very frothy, uh, money-grabbing kind of feeling around blockchain and NFTs that I'm pleased that we're... Uh, not swayed by. It's not what we're about. We're trying to. We have a, a mission that we're step by step following through on. NFTs are really interesting and exciting as well. It's not really what we do, but there is an allowance for if a filmmaker is making a piece of work, he can have a separate channel within our uh, our site where he can have a discussion or chat and and, and uh, potentially. Uh, trade NFTs to help sponsors film, and Leo can speak more about that. So there's a place for it in our world, but it's not what we're pursuing. But Leo, maybe you can explain it better. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I absolutely think there's huge potential for NFTs in our industry. Uh, we, we haven't, to date, I mean, that's not to say we aren't doing some NFT projects. We actually um, are going are attending NFTLA and at, at the end of the month, and, and um, we have a, a film crew collection, as we're calling it. Uh, I think it's the world's first collection, uh, NFT collection of film crew uh, characters. So there's the director and a producer, and it's a fun project, uh, I think. Um, so I, I think that there's absolutely a place for it. Uh, I just I think I, there is this this sort of stigma. Uh, around NFTs, and we want to be super careful about it. Um, but uh, I, I do think also that you know they will change. I, th I think the biggest disruption that blockchain in general can have in this industry um, is, is around you know fairness for artists when it comes to profit distributions, and I think NFTs can play a huge role in in that. Um, you know, not only from artists, musicians, you know, creating NFTs out of their songs and, and records and such, but uh, when it comes to ticketing for filmmakers, um, and I could talk about this for a while, <laughs> so stop me if you want, but, um, you know, you have an NFT ticket and it, uh, you know, has a state of redeemable uh, state and then, you know, you go to the theater, you, you cash it in, it's been burned, but then you still have this piece of art. And uh, you know, imagine you had a ticket stub from the opening night of Star Wars. You know, it's this interesting thing. You can keep it, and you know, potentially someone would want to trade it with you for their ticket, uh, their NFT. So there's that, but also it, it has to all be on chain, and, and uh, um, it needs to be um, auditable, right? So that you can prove this much money was actually earned. I mean. Uh, there's definitely um, been contention in, in the accounting methods of, of our industry, uh, and um, there's been lots of legal battles ar around that. Um, so uh, I won't get into any specifically, but <clears throat> uh, you know, I feel like if everything is auditable and immutable, um, we can you know use a smart contract to dynamically distribute the, the, the revenues to, to the stakeholders, the IP owners. Um, and and it, it would solve a lot of problems that we've had in, in the industry over the years. So I think that's going to be a huge disruption point. Um, and uh, I think that NFTs are going to play a large part in that. But there is uh, sort of this, like Roman said, frothy um, hype around NFTs that I think we, you know, not just us, but the industry needs to be careful because people are paying tons of money for these things at this point. And, 
you know, people can get burned uh, like that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd like to hear from Tiffany about how your generation approaches um, technology and NFTs and blockchain in particular. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's definitely like a lot of different camps. Like I have some friends who have like really embraced NFTs, like they're like selling them. Um, I have other friends who kind of, yeah, share like the environmental concerns um, around that and everything. Um, but personally for me, oh, sorry. Um, for me, I think I, I came from like a similar sort of background of Roman where like I was, I grew up in Silicon Valley, so I was always surrounded by technology. Um, and I have come to view as sort of like, um, I think seeing like a lot of potential within these technologies and I think it's up to a lot of like these stakeholders and like organizations and people building the ecosystem to really make sure that it's done right um, so that like yeah it's done responsibly and that people can actually like benefit from it instead of being like exploited as we're seeing with some uh, different like NFTs. Um, but yeah I think like Going forward, it's just going to be really interesting to see like the development of um, like this Web three space and like how it's all going to come together. Do you think there's hope um, for like what it's going to offer and sort of alternative markets than sort of traditional ways um, amongst your peers? Uh, I definitely hope so. Yeah, like um, I think there's so much good that like could come from it if like if done responsibly again but I mean it's like we have Leo working on it so um, <laughs> yeah no, no pressure but <laughs> wow. um, the metaverse <laughs> I guess like slightly hardball question but what are the where are we at with the technology what are, are there challenges that I mean I'm sure the, the challenges that you encounter, encounter every day but what do you think um, how are things progressing and what needs to happen? Well, I, I think that when we were pitching this project in 2017 and getting glazed eyes from most of the people <laughs> in town, um, it's, it's changed a lot, uh, obviously. There's a lot more um, people that you know, understand this technology and understand the value of self-sovereignty of value. Um, that was confusing, but <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, I think you know people are learning and it's becoming more user friendly, and and there are, are very interesting apps uh, that you know make key management and, and security better. Um, so you know it, it's opening it up to, to uh, the masses, and um, you know there's there's some really cool uh, opportunities like in, in the metaverse, for example. We are working on this this uh, virtual studio uh, idea that um, you know the app that I describe as the film financing app is a department in that virtual studio, and uh, we intend to, to build out all the various departments that you would find at a you know conventional film studio, um, but in, in a metaverse type environment, and we sort of plotted out some land that we're gonna you know potentially build it. We actually have a, an old blueprint of um, the, the Zoetrope studio, um, which I think now is Hollywood Center. I think so, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, it was the original studio my dad had in LA for a brief period where he made it, one from the heart and a few other films, but we're sort of modeling this virtual space uh, after that space. And so we'll have a casting department and have a camera department, editorial, sound suites, and all the the things that you would find in a sort of dream studio, but uh, just virtually. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, do we, yeah. Hmm. Do we want to start with questions, or what do you think? Do, is there anything that you'd like to add before? No, maybe we'll get some questions going, and then it'll... I mean, I, I could do a little demo of the platform, uh, if that sounds like something people would want to see. Um, I believe this is the... Ooh. That's not going to work. It's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's an HDMI. I, mean, I got these little USB-C ports. But um, uh, shoot. If, if they can well, hear me back there and they have a converter from HDMI to USB-C, I will do a demo. OK, well, um, let's, let's see what happens. But um, <laughs> OK. Oh, wow, look at that. Yay. <laughs> Okay. Sweet. Can you finance someone live? <laughs> like, can you fix 
<laughs> like, what's your Venmo? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> oh. oh, you can't see that yet, can you? Okay. Oh, one second here. It's on the on the screens. Oh, great! Uh, it's very big. Um, so these are funding rounds that uh, are. This is our staging environment, so it's all dummy data. I apologize, it, um, but uh, these are dummy proposals. So, for example, this proposal here. You can read about it. Um, you can. You know, check out the media. This is also where you would, you know, potentially download a screenplay or a treatment or watch a pitch video. Um, these were dynamically created with a with a software script to test um, scalability. So they're not very interesting, and it's you know even less interesting text. But um, you get the idea. Uh, then people can review them. Uh, you you know can uh, oops. You can. Um, so, what do you get when you review? So, okay, good, good question. So, this right here is is the bounty for for this proposal. So, anyone who reviews it will earn a slice of that bounty. So, if I want to review it, I can click review. This uh, particular funding round has these three value sets: commercial valuability, creativity, or characters. If this was a documentary um, funding round, it would, you know. Social impact score would be an important one. Uh, approach uh, to, to shooting it would, would be an important one. But um, yeah, you can rate it uh, in the various value sets that are available for the round. And typical to screenplay coverage, you can pass, consider, or recommend the project. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. So is it, is it over once a certain number of people have reviewed it and you can't, no one else can review it anymore? No, good question. So this, this round has nine days to go. So this is the MT load test round one <laughs> round. And um, so basically anyone who wants to submit for this project or for this funding round uh, would have to do so within the next nine days and they would need to get reviews. Actually, there, there is two periods. There's a submission period that ends and then there's an additional number of days uh, for just reviewing and there's no more submissions after that. Um, so I'd have to actually look at this, this round to, to tell you uh, when, when the submission period ended. But um, you would see that when you create your proposal. Um, so for example, there's a ton of these here, but um, show details. So <laughs> my, <laughs> my developers are, you know, just kind of crazy. <laughs> um, so yeah, this one, you can see uh, February 28th was the start and March 11th is the end. So we will actually end today. Um, and so the, the rules would be, you know, submit a documentary, submit a uh, pitch video, um, you know, t tell us why you would want to shoot a, a project about whatever the subject matter is. Um, and, and so these can be dynamically created by people who, you know, want to make a donation or the foundation will also do their own. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I, I won't go through that entire process right now. So when it closes, when, when your reviewing time is up, what happens next? Um, so the, the math service crunches all the numbers, looks at all the reviews, and, and spits out the, the leaderboard. Yeah. Um, I can show that to you potentially from one of the older rounds. Um, one that is finished. Yeah, so here's here's one. Um, these were just random tests that we were doing, so they, there's only what, three votes. But um, it would rank it, and it would show um, if you click on the, the statistics, uh, you know which demographics um, responded to the material, how many of the voters were from certain areas of the world, and, and the reputation. 
uh, of those people as well. So every proposal, whether it's a winner or, or loser, will, will get this sort of report um, that they can use to, to analyze their, their project creatively as well. So that's exciting. What does it mean when it says stake on it? Like I see all this stake, what does that mean? Good question. Um, so when you're staking on uh, a, a project or voting on a project, um, you can add a stake to it. And really what that means is you're willing to lock up a portion of your balance um, for the duration of that particular proposal's review. So you can't use it for anything else. And that adds weight to it uh, as well as user reputation, the confidence score, and your timing score. Uh, so yeah, does that answer your question? Because you're risking your um, your assets, right? You're putting. You're not them actually. Upstate. You're not risking yeah, them. But they're you're locking them so you can't use them for anything else. So yeah, you're. You're, you're giving value to to your vote. That's right. You're adding weight to your vote, and um, you will actually earn more of the bounty based on your stake as well. So the same variables that we use to score the the proposals will be used to, to determine the the slice of of the bounty that you will receive for your your opinion. Um, also, how many other people in the community like your particular review, like endorse it as if they, th they agree with it. Um, that means it's, it, it, that adds weight and will you know, earn you more of the bounty as well. If you've submitted a project can you, um, and you get a review, can you chat with the reviewer? Yeah, good question. So um, uh, we, are, we have a Discord server and so you can dynamically, oops, um, you can dynamically create a channel within our Discord server as you are creating your proposals. There's a checkbox, I want to create a chat for my project. And so anyone who wants to join that particular chat can do so um, by, this one doesn't have a chat, but there would be a little chat icon right here. Um, I can try and find one with a chat. But anyway, um, and then by clicking that, it would open up our Discord server and you could chat with the filmmaker if they're online or ask them a question and when they come online they could answer it. And other people who are liking the project, um, it's a dedicated chat room to talk about that project. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we should go on to the questions as time is, is running out. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll read them for, for the benefit. Um, it seems like the voting will come from a very narrow group of people who are comfortable with blockchain. Is that a concern? I don't think so. Like, I, I watched like a few Vox videos like about blockchain, but I'm not an expert at all. Um, but I think it's just like um, the platform is designed where you can kind of come in and like upload any of your materials, whether that's like a pitch deck, like your script, um, any like log line or synopsis. Um, so it is very, in that respect, like very similar to pitching a project to like an executive or just kind of like a more traditional method or even like Kickstarter where um, you're kind of just using um, like very visual and like, um, yeah, visual ways to kind of tell your story and why people should support it. Yeah, I think that making the platform as user-friendly as possible is obviously super important. Um, so that application that I just showed you is actually you know, a progressive web app. So you can install it on your mobile device and, and you know, scroll through while you're waiting in line at, at Starbucks uh, and, and you know, read someone's project. Um, so we wanted to make it super accessible. But yeah, of course, um, there, there is a learning curve there, um, and we're aware of that, and we're gonna you know, make explainers and, and try and educate uh, our you know, users to be able to take advantage of this opportunity. Okay, um, are users able to export, um, I think that's data, based on, based off of the audience that the pitchers spoke to, thus creating marketing strategies? I mean, you could definitely use the data, which is not identifiable, to see which demographics are responding to your material. And yeah, absolutely, that would be a good way to target your, your marketing. Because when you sign up, there is certain, um, obviously, some, some Yeah, so because there. we're using crypto, um, it's you know regulatory advice that we do KYC on every user. It's actually also really important to, to prevent the Sybil type of attacks that I mentioned earlier. 
um, so that we know every single user in the ecosystem is actually a real human uh, and not, you know, a bot account or what have you, and someone's creating 10 different accounts. So we use a third party service to validate that uh, someone is a real human, and um, that way, uh, you know, we, we can be certain that the demographic data is accurate. So yes, they can access the demographic data, is that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, with this being vote-based, how are you addressing the popularity contest from queer quieting alternative approaches to such an art-driven medium? Well, no, I get it. It's, we, uh, there's sort of the rock tumbler effect of if a ton of people are voting for something then um, you kind of get an average. And so we're not interested in, in average, we're interested in something extraordinary. And I don't know all the nuance of our algorithm, but we've just discussed a lot of techniques, like for, for example, if something is really loved by one person and hated by another person, that's way more interesting than sort of a bunch ground. of people kind of liked it. So uh, again, I'm not sure how it's been implemented. Maybe Leo can speak to that, but that's, I'm very sensitive to that, that you know, kind of, uh, that we don't want the crowd just to kind of find kind of average, but we want to really promote and find the things that are striking and original and maybe are a little difficult. Um, so I think that's a great question, and it's something we've been uh, tended to and hopefully will bear, you know, bear true in the, in the, in the product. Yeah, uh, a, a project that, you know, has 100,000 votes at 75, versus a project that had 50,000 at 90 and 50,000 at 50 or whatever it is to get to 75. Um, would, would the, 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 the one where everyone's saying it's okay is not gonna score as well as the one where there's a clear divide. Right. Because you know, those, type, those are the ones that you know, people talk about, people argue about. Um, there's, there's a reason that some people love it and some people dislike it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, those are absolutely the projects we're looking for. Okay, so are payments, awards, donations made in US dollars or Ethereum? Or will the, this platform have its own token? So yes, this platform will have its own token. Um, however, we are not financing films with the token. Um, we're financing the films with US dollars uh, that, you know, in a traditional sense. Your the tokens are simply used as an incentive mechanism to get people to review the films. And if they want to submit their own project or they want to use the tokens for another use within the virtual studio or another application, they can earn them um, by reviewing. But submitting proposals currently is, is the main function for that. Okay. Um, considering gender, race, and social structure, how diverse is the community who are evaluating the pictures and give mentorship to those emerging talents? I can um, speak to one little point, which is that we're really proud that we've been in touch with basically every single film school in the US and even expanding it beyond. Um, so there's a very deep desire to, to, uh, to have the outreach to be as diverse as possible, and um, those are the people that are going to be making the decisions. Uh, so, but it's very important. How else are we addressing that, Leo, to have diversity in our participants? Yeah, we've reached out to a number of um, nonprofit organizations that you know are promoting uh, equity in the arts, and, and um, we're aligning ourselves with them and, and creating awards um, with them. So, okay. uh, in terms of the actual community right now. Um, it's, it's hard to say, but you know, uh, we are actively pursuing uh, working with organizations that will help us with that. Yeah, and you can spread the word as well. Yes. And sign up. <laughs> um, okay, can non-film people invest in this somehow? I want to buy some. That's a very good question. Um, well, uh, yeah, you can, when we launch the public, uh, platform publicly, um, you can sign up. Uh, at app.decentralized.pictures. Um, for now, join our Discord server and um, we'll be updated as we go. Yeah. You can do that by clicking on the QR code that was When there. it reappears. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, describe a best case scenario for a DCP film. Uh, that would be, you know, 
um, a filmmaker that we discover, um, and they have an amazing film, uh, and you know they ultimately, you know, are very successful. They win an Oscar, and we can you know stand behind them and say you know wow without us who knows maybe they would have given up on on movie making. I, I feel like that's sort of the best case scenario. Is like we're going to be successful based on on the success of the the artists that we. You discover. I don't know. Is, how do you feel about that? Yeah, uh, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> um, although decentralized pictures is based on the idea of transparent transparency, how do you all keep the process fair to all filmmakers and deal with rights licensing? Um, so there's two questions there. How do we make it fair for all filmmakers and deal with rights and licensing? Well, with rights and licensing, you know, we recommend that anyone register their, their IP with the Library of Congress before they submit. I mean, it's no different than crowdfunding on, on Indiegogo or what have you. You know, you need to protect yourself. Um, however, blockchain, I mean, this is a key use case for blockchain. You know, we take the submission, um, and all of the data that's within the submission and we hash it and we put it on chain so we can prove that that piece of IP existed at this particular time. Um, it's kind of like the, we called it the poor man's copyright in film school where you like send yourself your script, registered mail and you have it. But, um, you know, I, I feel like blockchain is, is, to date, I don't know of any cases where it's, it's been proven uh, to show that someone owns something, but I imagine you know, it's just as good as a copyright in my mind uh, because you can actually mathematically prove that this piece of data which held this story existed on this day and if no one else can prove that they had that before you um, and it's not been registered at the library of or the copyright office, then yeah, so. Um, quick last question. Does it cost money to submit a project? If so, how much? I know that you get asked this a lot, so. Um, so yes, it, it costs money to submit a project. Uh, you don't necessarily have to spend your own money. You can work for your submission um, by reviewing other people's projects. Uh, the, the amount will be based on the award size. So right now we're thinking um, somewhere in the range of a $100,000 award would, would be a $100 submission fee um, and use that scale up or down. I think it's important to note in these last 30 seconds that if you are um, a filmmaker somewhere else in the world who doesn't make money in US dollars, you can review and by the, you know, um, through your reviews, you can, you can um, gain your entry fee. Absolutely, and you're on the exact same playing field as everyone else, whether you're in a mansion castle in Beverly Hills or you're in a developing nation, you're gonna be treated the exact same way uh, in terms of the rewards you receive for your opinion. So, um, you know, we're excited about that. Thank you. My own time. <laughs> Great. Thank you.